Hey friends, it's Riska, and in today's video, I want to give you a little bit of a breakdown um, behind my latest video for a tracker uploader called Kill em All. If you haven't seen that yet, um, I'll leave a link down below in the description. It'll be the previous video uploaded before this one. And it makes extensive use of um, these three things here. So we've got the Synstrom Deluge, Tangible Waves AE Modular Starter Rack 2, and the Empress FX Zoya. And let me just start off by saying that I freaking love this setup at the moment. Um, like... I don't have enough time to dig into it because there's, every time I sit down to use this setup, there's just so much to explore. You know, I mean, you've got a synth, sequencer, looper, practically a workstation built into the deluge here with like wavetable synthesis and FM synths as well. Um, but then over here, you know, on the Zoya, uh, at the moment, the Zoya is being used for um, pr providing a mix. But, you know, you've got a full-blown synth engine and effects engine built into the Zoya. And then you've got this AE modular system up here, which is just, you know, a awesome little modular synth with tons of room for expansion. I've definitely got my eyes out um, on a couple of new modules that just came out for it. But sort of rerouting these in different ways opens you up to so many possibilities. You know, at the moment, we're using this synth um, as the base synth, but we could pretty much make, you know, crazy samples on this thing and plug them right into the deluge or we might want to route them through the zoya for even more effects first and then route that into the deluge um i don't even have cv cables like um patching cables for controlling um the cv on this and this i'm just using midi at the moment and i can't wait to get some because i just feel like the possibilities will open up exponentially more than so yeah in case you haven't noticed i'm absolutely loving this setup every time i sit down to use it there is something new to try out there is something new to explore i don't feel limited in any way and although i get the um age-old saying that limitations breed creativity i'm finding a lot more creativity um, when all of these limitations are just open-ended for me so going back to the track, um, what we're going to do today is go on a bit of a walkthrough with how the track is set up, um, you know, how we've set up the bass synth on here, how we've um, set up the track on here to be performed, and how we're mixing it on the Zoya. Now, this isn't really my favorite track in the world. Um, in fact, I think that it's kind of boring. There could have been a lot more elements thrown into it. But it was definitely more of a proof of concept to see if something worked because as all of you know i'm working on producing a um, deluge workflow guide uh, that series is about to start filming this week i'm really excited to dive into doing that but in that series i really want to explore a lot of different performance options and although i'm not really doing an awful lot when performing this track the proof of concept that i wanted to sort of play around with was being able to set up complex parts in the arranger view and then while that is performing jump over into song view have a bit of a play around in a certain spot in the song and then jump back to arranger view so that we're not getting lost we're not getting confused it sort of makes things a lot easier to navigate because if we go into song view there's actually a lot of tracks here um, set up and playing all of those and navigating the sections and whatnot can get a little bit confusing. So by using the arranger view, we're able to get around that. So enough chit chat. Um, let's dive into how the song is broken up. So basically there are a couple of main parts. We've got an intro, which sounds like this. So with this really being part one, starting after the intro. And then if we skip forward a little bit more, we've got something like a chorus. And then um, this sort of uh, other, I guess, second chorus part, which is also used as a bridge.
So a couple of things to note real quick before we dive into like um, how a lot of that is set up and why it's set up that way. I just want to point out, um, you're listening to this in mono at the moment, and I've modified my little mixing patch on the Zoya here um, to only have one output. So we're just hearing a mono output, and that's purely because, as I've said in previous videos, um, I'm kind of limited by my audio interface, but I'm working on fixing that. For now, though, um, let's dive in and have a look at why we're even using the Arranger View in the first place. So the main reason at the start for me diving into this was because of this intro section. We've got um, this sort of air raid siren sound. And then we've got this screaming vocal chant saying, kill them all. We've got some hi-hats coming in and the bass coming in there as well. Now, performing this in song view uh, proved to be a bit challenging. I definitely could have gotten away with it um, and sort of played around with a few different things to make it work. But for example, if we were to just highlight um, these areas, so we've got the um, screaming vocals, we've got the air raid siren, uh, we'll include the bass and maybe some hi-hats. So we can hear that that kill them all is repeating and it sounds like a, a tiny bit weird and I had a specific way I wanted it arranged. So I decided to just plug it into a range of view. And that means that as soon as this section ends, we enter the main section. So the beauty of that is that I could let this intro play out. Maybe we'll just skip to the end here. Great, and now that we're in the midst of this, we'll press song and hit one of these pads. Now we're in song view and that section is just looping until we do something to change it. You know, we could include the um, build and riser. We could toggle between these two different hi-hats. So yeah, that kind of gives us the ability to just jam around with things, jam around with the base patch, and then jump back into a range of view and move on to the next section as soon as we're ready. Notice if we have this playing, We go to song view. We can go to the last four bars here. Um, yeah, maybe from about here. And now we can see how many loops we have remaining before it jumps back into a range of view. Now we're in the chorus. We can jump back into song view. And now we're in song view. That's just going to continuously loop like before. When we're sick of that, we can jump back into a range of view and maybe go to the next section. We can see that we still got a loop remaining and it's going to pick up from here. So yeah, we could toggle a lot of these tracks on and off. I did find it quite tricky um, with this section where we have this tiny little piano section coming in. Um, you know, that's only like a very short little snippet and jumping to that in song view, playing it and then quickly jumping to another section and triggering the clips that I wanted. It was, it was doable, but it was just tricky. And I didn't really want to be overthinking things while I was performing it and risk stuffing up. So the idea is, is that, yeah, we could let a ranger take care of this for us. We've already set things up and then jump back into song view and jam around like we normally would. Another advantage to doing things this way is, and I haven't done this in this track, but if you wanted to record automation of maybe a filter sweep, um, delay and reverb and decimation all happening at once, 
Um, doing that in song view again is going to be problematic because we've only got these two effect knobs to work with. So we could set something like that up in a ranger view and then jump into a ranger view, let a ranger take care of everything and then jump back into song view. Now we're going to dive into how each track was set up in a second, but one other thing I want to point out is that I've pretty much set up my song from left to right here and it's arranged exactly how I would arrange it in Ableton. But you don't even have to go that far as long as you have your basic sections mapped out. I mean, we could go here and just sort of split sections up like so. And we'll move over here and maybe split this one up. And this way you can easily identify like, okay, there's my intro, uh, there's my first verse, there's my chorus and so on and so forth until you get it um, kind of broken up exactly the way that you want it to be. Then you're not really having to sit down for ages and arrange your entire song from left to right. You've just got your basic sections laid out and they're just jumping off points for you to quickly take care of things in a range view and then jump back into performing with song view. There's so many different ways that you can do this and I hope that I'm explaining it in a clear way. I just want to really point out the benefits of doing things like this because I do see a lot of complaints online saying like, you know, it's really hard to perform with the Doge unless you have an external MIDI controller and, um, you know, only having these two knobs to control effects is really limiting. And definitely while that is the case, you can still get around things by setting up things in the range view and performing with that. Now I'm going to save a lot of um, performance techniques for the workflow series, but one other thing that I kind of liked about this track, um, and it just gave me something to do, which, you know, I guess looks cool to the camera, is um, if we find this drum track, we'll just solo this out. So this is just a variation on a basic four to the floor beat. But then we've got another copy of it. And it has this hi-hat at the top. Now it's just an open hi-hat, but we have a delay on. Now in stereo, this is ping-ponging, but also note that this is an analog delay. So this is the digital version. This is the analog version. It sounds slightly different. And if we crank it um, into sort of the feedback zone, we can get almost like a filter suite happening on this hi-hat. And it just gives you something else to perform with and something else to play around with. Going down the list, all the higher rhythms are just programmed in. There's a little bit of mixing and reverb on each track. Nothing too special. We have a basic noise oscillator. So that filter sweep. And you know, with the drums, sounds like this. So we're really getting that pumping sidechain effect. And it's also worth noting that on a track like this, when we select the sidechain, we can toggle between fast or a slow sidechain compressor. And I'm using the slow one just because it gives it a little bit more of a pump. Now, I'm just going to turn all of these off just so it's a little bit clearer. And maybe I should have talked about this at the start, but basically the way that I've set things up is a little bit different to how I would normally do it um, in other tracks. But we've got those weird intro elements um, up here. Along the top here, this is just a blank audio track so that I can monitor the input signal from the AE modular. Then we've got like the weird air raid siren and the kill em all phrase, followed by that light little piano phrase. So I've marked these, these sort of weird colors just so that I can quickly identify them in song view because really when I'm in song view, I don't really want to be messing around with either of these four. Next up, we have this blue section. Now, this is all percussion-based stuff, and a lot of them are duplicates. So we have the basic uh, filter noise, but we've got a kick drum, the variation of that. So when I select this, it'll turn off the original. That's the one with a hi-hat. And then our two hi-hat tracks. 
So every time I look at this in song view, I can instantly see that these are my percussion elements. There's only five of them and I can play around with them in song view. And then there's really not much more to the track. We've just got a bass synth. So these can only be triggered one at a time. We have three different variations on our bass sequence. And then we've got these strings down the bottom here, which again, can't play at the same time. If we want to have a quick listen to those two, this is just a basic FM patch that I set up. It's nothing too special, but we can play around with the um, uh, FM mods, get a bit of a different tone. That's essentially how each of the track elements and everything are made up in the Doge. Also, uh, this is a little bit embarrassing, but I might as well point out um, the Air Raid Siren is just me um, going like gritting my teeth together and humming slightly. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just got a ton of like distortion and saturation and whatnot on it. So I didn't have an Air Raid Siren and I just decided to use my mouth. Um, and same for the uh, kill more phrase. That's just me screaming kill more, but it's played at a few different octaves. With a ton of saturation and whatnot. So yeah, um, I think that pretty much wraps it up for the deluge side of things. Now let's get into the AE modular side of things. Um, so this bass patch is really fun to mess around with. I probably could have messed around with it a whole lot more while I was performing, but I just, I guess I didn't want to stuff up or something. So um, let's have a listen and see what we can do with this. Uh, basically, we're just taking a square oscillator into a wasp filter, which is like a really, really resonating filter. Uh, we are using the clock from the deluge to mess around with this sample and hole module. And that is controlling the CV on our filter so that we can get some slight variation in the filter opening and closing, depending on how fast the clock is going. It's also using the noise oscillator um, to sort of randomize that. Next up, we're using this attenuator to control another CV on the filter. So that's just the frequency opening and closing and the resonance opening and closing. And then we've got this other one, which is controlling the decay on the envelope. So there's not really a whole lot to it. It's quite similar to what I set up in a previous video, but let's explore a lot of the options that this opens up for us because you can get a really cool range of bass sounds just by doing this. So let's have a listen. We'll just turn off that other one. And we'll turn down the delay. So if we want, we can use this knob to play around with the envelope. And we can use this knob to open and close the filter slightly. Now, if we turn the CV knob all the way down, we're not getting any of that weird randomization. But if we were to turn this up a little bit, can hear that now the filter is opening and closing and it's doing it in sync with this little blinking red light over here. You can speed this up. We'll slow it down. And if you really want to get crazy with that sound, you can throw in a lot more resonance. When you have that resonance in there, it's a lot of fun to mess around with the delay. So you can see like, 
there's so much fun to be had in just twisting a lot of these knobs and trying out different combinations and stuff once you got everything patched in. Let's turn the resonance down slightly. And the CV. Great. So one other thing which I didn't perform with in the video, um, I kind of just liked it the way it was, but with this square wave, we can control the pulse width and that really defines how much dirt you have or how much of that gritty high end you have in your base. So right now, it's kind of dirty. We'll just lengthen this a bit. But if we turn this to the left, Now, if we turn it too far, it's going to cut out. Now it's like a lot more of a cleaner tone. It's not exactly like um, a sine wavy sounding bass, like an 808, but it's getting there. Um, but yeah, again, if we turn this more to the right, you're gonna hear a lot more dirt. Now, if we turn up our resonance and open this filter a bit more. got like more lower tones. I just found the sweet spot I like was about here. I could just play around with this all day. So yeah, I'm just gonna uh, reset a couple of these things back to roughly where they were. So yeah, that's basically the AE modular all wrapped up. Now let's quickly talk about the Zoya here. Um, it's basically the same patch that I used in my previous video. And if you didn't see that quick walkthrough, we have an audio in. Um, <clears throat> maybe we'll just play uh, one basic section of this. Great. So we can see the audio is coming in here. It's then being fed into a compressor and it's quite heavily compressed. So you'll notice that uh, the audio going in is a lot louder than the audio coming out. So to combat that, we have the audio out being plugged into a VCA. If we look at the output of our VCA, it's a little bit louder, not by much, but just a little bit. The left and right channel of that then get fed into two OD and distortion patches. So it's basically just adding a tiny bit of saturation to both. And then finally, it's being fed into this tone control. The tone control is obviously then output to the VCA. And this little white dot, um, again, it's nothing. It's just there so that I can see something flashing um, to check how loud or how quiet audio is. Because if we press play, um, you'll see that things are flashing. But you know, if you turn this down too far, you'll see that a lot of this stuff stops happening. And that's because it's not really picking up as much of a signal anymore. Push this too high. Um, I'm not going to do it because it's going to be super loud. But yeah, if you push too high, some of these modules will start flashing red to indicate that they're clipping. So that's a really useful um, visual element of this thing. Now, with this tone control, um, it is making a massive difference. We have a uh, real push into the bass, and you can add more of these um, controls to really sort of fine tune where your bass frequencies are and whatnot. 
I wanted to keep it kind of limited. So this is just boosting the bass and it's dropping a fair amount of the mids and the frequency range for the mids that I chose was around 500, so yeah, 492. And then we're boosting the highs quite a bit as well. And just to show you what a difference this Zoya is making right now, let's hit play and I'll just toggle it on and off. So right now it's on. If we would turn this off, It's quite boring. Um, it's really sucked a lot of the life out of it. I mean, it, it's still essentially the same track, but that bass just really isn't there. And the only way around that that I found was really playing around with like these pulse width and filter controls on the AE modular. But I didn't want to be playing around with those and lose a lot of the bass tone while I was performing with it. So boosting the bass on the Zoya, really compressing a lot of that really helps. So yeah, anyways, that's basically the whole setup of the song. I know that was a really long video and I probably gaffed on a lot, but again, I'm just freaking in love with this setup at the moment. Um, Tangible Waves have just announced that they're bringing out um, a new native instruments module, um, Rings, which I think they're calling Rains. Uh, I always get confused with the names of those, but I play around with that module so much in VCV Rack and I can't wait to get my hands on it. I'm gonna be ordering it um, in the new year probably slotted in there because there's so much creative potential with that single module uh, i mean i've also got my eye on like a tiny little nano groove box that i wouldn't mind throwing in here just because it offers um, really fun granular synth control but at the moment i mean this is enough this is such a great doorless setup and uh i see like a lot of doorless performers out there trying to sort of do like mini or fairly compact setups and i think as far as they go this one's really great. Um, I'm absolutely loving it. I guess the biggest downside of everything uh, at the moment, if I had to really give it a critique, is no like um, audio over USB from the W, so I can't exactly plug it into Ableton and record each track separately unless I sit down and work at it for an hour, and that's a huge pain in the ass. I really hope that they address that with an update someday. But for now, it is what it is. Another downside to the setup at the moment is like, yeah, again, I don't have um, a sort of dedicated audio interface. I have to move this over to this desk every time I want to film it. I wouldn't mind getting a setup where all of this is sort of set up nicely. This is on a laptop stand above it, um, maybe with a couple of speakers either side. So I could just completely drive this thing away from the computer and needing my computer to sort of record different elements and whatnot. But I mean, um, yeah. I hope that you guys have enjoyed the video. Now that I've finally got this one out of the way, I can unpatch all of this and dive into filming the Deluge Workflow series. I've been um, in pre-production with that for quite some time, and I know I get a lot of people asking me about it and how it's going, so I um, hope it hasn't been built up too much. I think it'll be fun. Um, but yeah, hit the like if you like, and if you don't, tell me why. Please subscribe, check me out on Patreon, and thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.